Hello and welcome to the 23rd episode of the Mike McNair Revolutionary Strategy Series. Today is Monday the 2nd of September 2019 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we finished the long march through Chapter 7, the Workers' Government Slogan. I've just posted the badges to the qualifying patrons this weekend, so they should be making their way to you as I speak. If you'd like to help out, you too can join the Patreon gang gang for as little as $5 a month, which works out at $1 an episode. Patreons get special bonus episodes, the right to vote on the reading group series and other cool stuff like badges too, depending on how much you donate. If you'd like to comment on the show, please do so on the YouTube channel and make sure to like, subscribe and share. You can also join me on Facebook or Twitter too. Okay, to the discussion. Let's keep going and try and do the empty slogan. An empty slogan. Without a clear minimum platform, the idea of a worker's government reduces to what it began with, a more, quote, popular expression for the idea that the workers should rule, or to what it extends, or excuse me, or to what it ends with, a communist government. It does not amount to a basis for working out concrete proposals for unity addressed to the workers who follow the socialist parties. This is made visible in Trotsky's report on the fourth Congress. Trotsky's initial account of the workers' government policy is as an alternative to counterpose to the socialists' coalitionism, one that expresses in a very basic way the idea of class independence. Trotsky expresses the view that there might be a workers or workers and farmers government in the sense of the Bolshevik left SR coalition of November 1917 through March 1918, i.e. a government of communists and left socialists as the beginning of the dictatorship of the proletariat. But the fact that this coalition was based on a very concrete minimum program, the distributive land policy as the solution to the food problem, peace without annexations, and all power to the Soviets, is wholly absent from this description. The question becomes concrete in relation to Saxony, where the uh, SPD and KPD together had a majority in the land assembly, and the local SPD proposed to the KPD a provincial government of the workers' parties. The Comintern Congress told the KPD to reject this proposal, but the reasons given by Trotsky are not political reasons that could readily be explained to the rank and, ranks and supporters of the SPD. If you, our German communist comrades, are of the opinion that a revolution is possible in the next few months in Germany, then we would advise you to participate in Saxony in a coalition government and to utilize your managerial posts in Saxony for the furthering of political and organizational tasks and for transforming Saxony in a certain sense into a communist drill ground so as to have a revolutionary stronghold already reinforced in a period of preparation for the approaching outbreak of the revolution, but this would be possible only if the pressure of the revolution were already making itself felt, only if it were already at hand. In that case, it would imply only the seizure of a single position in Germany, which you are destined to capture as a whole. But at the present time, you'll of course play in Saxony the role of an appendage, an impotent appendage, because the Saxon government itself is impotent before Berlin, and Berlin is a bourgeois government. At best, it is a vulgarized form of the arguments of Engels and Kautsky against minority participation of a workers' party in a left bourgeois government. So what's McNair saying? Was Trotsky a dick or not? He's going to go into why Trotsky, you know, misunderstood a bunch of stuff there. But there is there is a point here where he zeroes in on what an actual minimum platform, minimum program, as we call it, um, would I'm be. I'm not actually sure that he would say that it's the same thing because the minimum platform is a platform for taking power. Minimum programs are going to do with it. That's but interesting. I guess that... uh, say again. Uh, say that again, Derek. Well, I mean, the reason why I bring this up, and uh, Lexi and I have mutual trauma where we literally read like 8,000 <laughs> platforms and, and programs um, to write one uh, and eventually realized it was a waste of time. But um, <laughs> it's really informative race of time, though. But my, my point is the reason why the reason like it, like left comms use the word platform and not program for a reason. And um, they, they like 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 the IC, 
like all your like board diggers organizations and your council organizations, they have platforms and not programs. And the platforms mm -hmm. is about like what they would do immediately in power. It's like, it's like immediate demands, but right. it's not a minimum program. Cause there's no, like, it's, it's about what you're going to do immediately with power. And it's sort of what you do to kind of get power. Cause you're saying like, give me power so I can immediately do this. And then under the classical as pay day construction, then you go into the minimum program and then you go into the 85,000 stages of, the holy cross the <laughs> communism or whatever but like right right so it's a more responsible version of like transitional demands or it, it 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 comes in to solve the same problem in a more honest way yeah it's also an answer to all those left comms you know who will go like wait what you asked for doesn't you know doesn't build communism immediately right now right. and the uh the, the platform is like it's not about that necessarily it's about like what we're doing to miserate to 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 de-immiserate the working class and to establish our own power base and to create space to think the things through. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it, it is wonky because people seem to use platform and pl program interchangeably, except for these weird sectarians. But yeah, like I mean, I certainly do, you know, I, but I, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying there. And I guess the way that I've mapped this, and this might be because of, you know, the company I had been keeping, but it was, um, that the minimum program was a dictatorship of the proletariat and the so-called, you know, maximum program would be the first stage of communism or something. I, I do, I do imagine that, you know, upon like election or whatever, or, you know, putting them into power, they should be installing a dictatorship of the proletariat, right? Like, um, the minimum platform in that sense, I, can we, can we agree on that? Is that like a good way of getting around this or? Yeah. Well, I think that's, I think that's what, uh, I think that's what, I think that is actually why McNair uses the word. Cause he, he uses the word program earlier for. Yeah, no, that's fair. And this is so condensed that I'm actually going into like literary deconstructive mode and making sure I'm reading each word choice. Right. When I realized they use party in 85 different ways. You don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but this is a useful distinction. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder about this because when I was reading this for the first time, my brain just translated program, you know, for a platform every time. All right. We know, well, we know all about Derek and his, we know all about Derek and his love of parties and Coke. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> every type of party he'd get his hands on. <laughs> Derek, right. why don't you take this, this, this uh, next bit? Yeah, I'm going to do that. And then, I'll be bowing out yeah. in a second. But uh, misunderstanding. Yeah. The emptiness of the common terms workers' government slogan had several sources. All power to the Soviets as a general strategy was immediately linked to the sub mass strike strategy. As a side note, damn. Which ignored yeah. or marginalized the problem of coordinating authority, and the government is a particular form of coordinating authority. All power to the Communist Party had the effect of emptying out the program of the party in relation to the question of the state forum, because the Bolsheviks in, in 1918 to 1921 had effectively abandoned this program. The workers were of substance invited to trust the communist leaders because they were really committed to fighting the capitalists. <laughs> Sophie, you are right. This is sassy bitch territory. Anyway. Um, <laughs> When, within the framework, the common term proposes the possibility of a socialist communist coalition, it can say nothing more than the conditions for such a government is that it must be really committed to fighting the capitalists. Thus, this meaning that the empty of statements of abstract general principle, which form the minimum platform in the thesis, the concrete minimum platform used by the Bolsheviks in the summer autumn of 1917, which formed the basis of the government coalition created in October, summarized in the tag, lamb, peace, and bread, all power to the Soviets, is very precisely adapted to the Russian conditions at the time. Any government coalition proposal elsewhere would need to have the similarly highly concrete and highly localized character. At the international level, the minimum government policy would allow for communists to accept government responsibility, would have to be concerned with state form and how to render the state accountable to the working class, leaving national parties to identify the particular concrete economic, foreign policy, et cetera, measures by which these principles could be rendered agitational in a immediate concrete circumstances of their country. Damn, this is actually, it doesn't seem as scathing until you really s situate it in the context, but like mm -hmm. the stuff like all parts of the Communist Party is, they invited the workers to trust the communists because they were really, really committed to fighting the capitalists, which is like, Bitch, whoa. They were really, really committed. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, really, you know, really is in quotes. When I read this, I was like, man, that's that's a minimum platform I want. Being really, you know, like, <laughs> why, why are you hating McNair? Like, that's that's the kind of minimum platform we need. <laughs> Being well, really, like, really committed to fighting capitalism. Yeah, but you know what? Aristocrats are also really, really committed to fighting capitalism. So, like... oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's but it's in the other like, way. In the other way. Yeah. Trust us. You know, don't. We we're the all right. Like you're 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 the workers, and you put in the workers' party. Now let us let us handle it. Right. That's it's not the problem. Isn't with the 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 content of of the the slogan itself. The problem is how it historically played out. Like, really trust us. We'll handle it. And then they don't. The, the problem seems to be is that when ignoring the forms of authority in the form of this sub bakuninous mass strike strategy that we know as, you know, Lenin's initial appeal, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> when that collapses, it goes to all power to the Communist Party. For McNair, it seems like he would have been much happier if that when that collapsed as you know, Kalski was giving reasons to assume that an attempt like that would collapse, that it got routed into like a democratic Republican multi-party. Yeah, system. Like, like, like the state assembly, uh, uh, constituent assembly had not been, I don't know, abolished in 1921 or something. And the coalition of SRs and left Mensheviks and other people who didn't betray to the whites the first chance they got should have been allowed to stand. That seems yeah. to be the implication here and then another interesting thing it says though is like you do have to deal with this at a national level so like the immediate platform and this is why it's a little different from a program i think has got to be something quick sloganable but very specific to your country situation so the minimum platform right. in the u.s is not going to be the same as the minimum platform in the uk which is not going to be the same as the minimum platform in russia uh, right, but right. like the international platform is actually something else. And it's got to be like more like this is the kind of state we want everywhere. Yeah. And I think you're right to point out that he's not using the word program for platform because maybe program is what he means by that latter thing. Um, although like I, mean, I also think maybe he's doing it because he's going to talk about, you know, the Trotsky's uh, re like his his. <laughs> his retcon of what he meant by the stuff in 1917 and his 1938 transitional program. <laughs> Just a regular George Lucas. I almost like, I know that this book came out of McNair, like working with Trotskyists and actually has a lot of respect for Trotskyist tradition, but man is so much of it just shitting on Trotsky. Like, so when he's saying there, like the, the platform stuff should be specific. So say like if the Irish one was like, say, land, peace and death to all leprechauns, we wouldn't have that as a universal one. <laughs> that we're saying. Why not? Yeah. I think so. It's a real problem. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking leprechauns. Well, I mean, like land, peace and fuck the British actually probably would work. So. <laughs> <laughs> that would work for everyone. That would work for yeah, everyone. That would work. Yeah, that should like, be our international platform. Like literally. <laughs> There's no country on the world that would object too harsh about that. Even the Americans go, oh, yeah, fuck them. Yeah, it's actually the only thing I like about Mel Gibson is his, <laughs> his deep seated hatred of the British. It's, it's this minimum platform. <laughs> yeah, that's because they were they were anti Catholics. You know, that's yeah. what it is. Oh wait, so Derek, are you proposing a red brand alliance with Mel Gibson? Oh uh, no, no, oh, never yeah. mind. I take it back. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, what, the, what would that even be? That's not even Strasserism. That's like red red C Day Vaticanism. Uh, <laughs> people will try to make anything work, and with that, I'm out. Have fun making communism work without me. <laughs> Thank Peace you very much, Derek. <laughs> 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 This Bye time, there. this time you're leaving in better, in a better, better humor than the last time. I, I, I haven't threatened to to end you yet, Tom. I feel like <laughs> seriously, I'm walking down the street in London here. I'm checking behind me for assassins. I'm after watching like Austin Powers the other night, and it's got like I'm expecting odd job or random task to jump out and throw a fucking shoot my head. It's like it's like night. It's like a third common turn late popular front enforcement policy. Oh, an ice pick. Ooh. You can ice pick me. Yeah, I'm oh, yeah. ice pick. oh, God. <laughs> Derek, thanks Bye. very much for coming on. We'll talk to you in a fortnight. Yeah. All right. Cheers. Bye, Derek. Ciao. Bye. Okay, he's gone. Who wants to take... Uh, maybe I'll read this next little bit here. Does anybody else want to talk about the bit that we just... The last paragraph we read um, about uh, national parties um, 
focusing on local stuff and then talking about at the international level. That was kind of surprising to me because I've always conceptualized internationalism as abolishing nations. And so it was interesting to me that he used mm. national parties as the term to identify like these more locally focused parties. Is my conception of internationalism incorrect? Or is it that like the way McNair, McNair conceives of it is that any general like transition to communism, there has to be an intermediate stage where there's still probably there's national blocks that are internationally linked more similar to like the common turn or second international. Um, I think we tend to read Marx's internationalism through the 20th century. Um, but for Marx, a lot of this was going to be, yes, you win the battle of democracy within your country. The way, you know, the revolutions that Marx was looking at had a big role for nationalism, like in the Paris commune. It'd be hard to have the Paris commune without French nationalism, for instance. There, there's a pretty solid tradition of Marxist internationalism based on an association of the different nations that, that doesn't abolish and, and immediately transcend borders, um, okay. which is troubling, I guess, for, for you know, people coming from, I guess, our sort of tradition. But No, that, that, that makes a lot of sense, I guess, yeah, because I always have a hard time, like, squaring that circle, like, living along the southern border of the U.S., the idea of, like, maintaining mm -hmm. a even in like early stage socialism is like kind of appalling to me but yeah i, I also get the pra pragmatic application of it and i think as long as you have like open open borders with your fellow com you know six international countries or whatever you're fine okay trotsky's argument for the slogan in the 1938 transitional program gets halfway to this point of all parties and organizations which base themselves on the workers and peasants and speak in their name we demand that they break politically from the bourgeoisie and enter upon the road of struggle for the workers and farmers government. On this road, we promise them full support against capitalist reaction. At the same time, we indefatigably develop agitation around those transitional demands, which should, in our opinion, form the programme of the workers and farmers government. The problem is that the transitional demands of this only in the form of all power to the Soviets. They therefore either remain abstract or become economistic, as in the various British left group slogan, Labour government committed, committed to socialist policies. The most, fun, <laughs> the most fundamental, why are you laughing there, Alexi? It's, uh, it's just, I see the underlying point he's making, but the difference between all power to the Soviets and Labour government committed to socialist policies is telling. But it's part of the underlying dynamic he's talking about. Okay. What the is most, it telling of? Oh, it's telling of the uh, a slogan like all power to the Soviets and something that ignores the in it ins and outs of what it would actually mean to radically democratize an area um yeah. just leave a big vacuum of thought the idea that this I don't, I don't know this could apply to labor government committed to labor that's committed to socialist policies or something you know what i mean like that that people could read the the transitional program and then do that i don't know it's damning the most fundamental misunderstanding appears at the very beginning of the common turn thesis. In some countries, the position of bourgeois society is particularly unstable, and the balance of forces between the Workers' Party and the bourgeoisie places the gov question of government on the order of the day as a practical problem requiring immediate solution. In reality, in parliamentary regimes, every general election poses the question of government and every general round of local election also poses it since it indicates the electoral relationship forces or the relationship of forces between the parties at national level in presidential regimes the question of government is formally only posed in presidential elections but is indirectly posed in elections to legislator legislature the fact that it does so is central to the mechanism of the two-party system of corrupt politicians by which the capitalist class rules at the daily level in parliamentary regimes. The system was invented in Britain after the revolution of 1688 and has since been copied almost everywhere. The patronage of powers of government allow a party to, man to manage the parliamentary assembly, to promote its own electoral support and to make limited changes in the interests of its base and or its ideology. The outs therefore seek by any means to be in. In this game, the bureaucratic state core quite consciously promotes those parties and individual politicians who are more lo loyal to its party 
ideology. The result is that outside exceptional circumstances of extreme crises of the state order, it is only possible to form a government on the basis of a coalition in which those elements loyal to the state party have a veto. Those socialists who insist that the immediate task of the movement is to fight for a socialist government outside extreme crisis of the state necessarily enter the game and become socialist loyalists. Yeah. Let's yeah. let me read will I read this last do it. Let me read this last thing. It's been a lot there together. 18th century British Commonwealthmen and Republicans understood the nature of their game of the game better than 20th century socialists and communists. Their solution was to reduce the powers of patronage of the central government bureaucracy and its ability to control the agenda of the legislature. They were defeated in Britain by the Tory revival and in the early US by the Federalist Party. Republicans in France were defeated by Bonapartism. But their ideas echo in Marx's writing on the Commune and in Marx's and Engels' attacks on Lasallianism and in Engels' critique of the Air Force program. Okay, uh, what do you make of all that? I think in one of the first paragraphs it said, the position of the workers' parties uh, put the bourgeois state on unstable ground. Yeah, in every election, like, you know, it's a fight over who gets political power. I don't, I don't know if that's like a good comeback to what that paragraph says, because I think the common turn statement saying that it's a question of class power, not question of power between the various parties. Well, I think um, I think what kind of what, like McNair is getting at here is that there's kind of this assumption that just by and maybe I'm misreading both Trotsky and McNair, but what I took from that is that there's this kind of assumption that like by the ex very existence of a workers party, uh, any state is like a destabilizing feature but i think that has been proven incorrect why because the party could be irrelevant is that what you're saying because the party could be subsumed which is generally what happens yeah, like he's making the case here against again he's making this case against going into government coming down <sighs> yeah. hard on it i mean like in terms of okay if you're i mean yeah if outside a, an enormous like crisis of the state if you if your main task right now is to just get into government, there's no reason to assume that the momentum of the government won't consume you. Like, or maybe I should say, if you want to make a, a government without a crisis of state, the state will take over your government. Makes sense. Uh, it's, it's And you would really need a pretty yeah. solid alternate power base for that to not happen. That's a really good way of putting it. And, and there, is he saying that this power base is emergent from the crisis? Like, if the state is not in crises, and you try and become the, the leading party, you will get subsumed by the state. And if you're, but if the state is in crisis, you can push through revolutionary change. I think that's a very good way of the way you worded it, Lexi. It's, I think it's correct. And I, I think of these, these uh, conversations using the definition of state as like the special body of armed men standing above and over the proletariat. And I think when we're talking about like a crisis of the state, what we're really saying is that, that, um, body of art it's not certain that that body of armed men would be able to maintain order essentially i think i don't think i think it's more broad i think there could yeah. be a crisis of the state that's not necessarily just about the armed men you know like i i you know when mcnair talked about the state he says like his fundamental base is the is the is the power but like say say for example i think i mentioned it last week but like say there was an uh, a hard brexit in the uk for example and imports and exports stopped coming in out of the country well and the shortages in the shops and loads of factories closed down in that scenario there like if you had some kind of large radical party they could act in a way that would be different than if they just took power in a normal election i think that's what lexi's really trying to say yeah there is a more expansive i mean you could use the the, the very narrow definition of state for that and it, and it does get across what i'm saying but also what tom is saying is 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 kind of closer to what I mean in that there is something under the government, under the current, you know, electoral regime that would have to be in crisis for an electoral regime to be able to fundamentally change that underlying apparatus. And so, you know, put whatever you want in the state, you know, like for in, in American politics, sometimes people will call this the deep state. The, the point is, is that it's the long-term apparatus. There would have to be a, a change in that kind of that kind of regular reproduction of things, and I mean, at base, it is the military. It is the special body of armed men. But you know, in a lot of 
a lot of cases, we're really talking about a lot of the forms of legitimacy about the state um, and, you know, their ability to, to function during like, you know, periods of like low legitimacy or something like if there was, if there was a deterioration of the American state and further, <laughs> further than just problems of governance, but like well, a true state crisis. Yeah. Like it doesn't have to be like a, a total flummoxing of the police forces and the military empire in order for there to be some kind of soft power opportunity. Okay, we have one section left in this chapter. Woo! It's two pages. Woo! I have nearly underlined the whole goddamn lot. So why don't we just start mm. mashing into it and reading it. Lexi, you haven't read in a while. You've been ditching away, going for a cup of coffee, <laughs> all this kind of low rent stuff. It's up to you now to, to bring us out of this and finish and roll us off. Let's go. Political platform. This understanding enables us to formulate a core political minimum platform for the participation of communists in a government. The key is to replace the illusory idea of all power to the Soviets and the empty one of all power to the Communist Party with the original Marxist idea of the undiluted democratic republic or extreme democracy as the form of the dictatorship of the proletariat. This implies universal military training and service, democratic, political, and trade union rights within the military, and the right to keep and bear arms, election and recallability of all public officials, public officials to be on an average skilled worker's wage, abolition of official secrecy laws, and of private rights of copyright and confidentiality, self-government in the localities, i.e. the removal of powers of central government control and patronage, and abolition of judicial review of the decisions of elected bodies, abolition of constitutional guarantees to the rights of private property and freedom of trade. There's certainly many more aspects, more in the Communist Party of Great Britain's draft program. These are, main, these are merely points that are particularly salient to me when writing. A workers' government policy is a united front policy. A workers' government policy as a united front policy would have to combine these issues summed up as the struggle for the undiluted democratic republic or extreme democracy with salient immediate not transitional demands such as for britain the abolition of the anti-union laws an end to the private finance initiative the renationalization of rail and the utilities without commitment to such a minimum platform communists should not accept governmental responsibility as a minority Contrary to Trotsky's argument on Saxony, whether the conditions are revolutionary or not makes no difference to this choice. To accept governmental responsibility as a minority under conditions of revolutionary crisis is, if anything, worse than doing so in peaceful times. A crisis demands urgent solutions, and communists can only offer these solutions from opposition. Yeah, that's interesting. I really like that, where he says it's like, in a revolution crisis, the worst thing you can do is... yeah become like the government you know as in yeah. before the revolution hits right become the junior partner in the failing government right yeah it's like the stupidest goddamn idea you ever heard in your life but but from <laughs> short-term power maximization like it's totally like that's how the equation works out if you have people that i'm politically sort of close to right now like are are driving themselves in circles being like fuck we got to fix climate change right now i'm i don't care what of my silly marxist principles i have to put to the side in order to address this you can see obviously where the the panic of short term political rationality just totally implodes on itself here i just have a great example for you uh, I don't know if anybody listened to the Chapo Trap House this week. I've listened to they did a a, a live one in 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 Dublin. They were doing like a oh. European tour or something, and they were kind of taking the mick out of the different Irish political parties. And they said, "What about the Irish Labour Party?" And the entire audience of like lefties booed. And it was like, <laughs> you know, this is this was the party that was built by Connolly and Jim Larkin. You know radical yeah. socialists and in the in the crisis of 2008 in ireland when like the imf were brought in and everything what happened was the reason why there's such hatred for them what happened was uh labor were they there was a, an election and they did quite well like they got like maybe i mm -hmm. think 24 or 5 percent and what did they do instead of 
like staying out of government, they went into government and they implemented all the austerity. And the reason why they kind of did it, because in Ireland, the Labour Party has morphed into this weird party of basically the unions that are um, like government unions, you know, like whether you're in the working in the health executive or you're working in the health department or, you know, so it was like the state uh, you know, the teachers and stuff like that. And so they wanted to protect the, the wages of basically certain cliques uh, in the state. Mm. And so they went in. And so what they ended up doing is destroying their party. Now they're down to 5% or 6%. And like literally if they hadn't have gone in at the time, they would have become, for the first time in Irish political history, they would have become the dominant, there would have been a dominant left party. And they wow. would have actually probably got power in, you know, after two or three years when that next government had fallen. And what did they do? They went short term and they got iced, you know, yeah. and they, they lost, I think, three quarters of their TDs in the next election. So it's like, it's just exactly what they shouldn't have done. Uh, you know, it's so depressing. It's so depressing. And and strangely, it comes from taking power seriously, too seriously in a way, right? Yeah. They think, oh, we'll be able to actually do something. We'll be able to do fuck all. The, one's pragmatism can work against you in those circumstances. Oh, I think like a lot of the, these European, this happened in like a lot of the European countries after the 2008 crisis, like with Spain, with the United Left. You know, they joined the they joined the government. Uh, maybe the Communist Party joined, and uh, they were pretty much subordinated to you know the. I mean, it's not even uh, in within one country. They were subordinated to the broader European policies and were forced to accept, you know, austerity measures and what so on. It, yeah, it's interesting in the in the Irish example, the one party who has got long term strategy is Sinn Féin, the Republican Party. You know, the party of the Provisional IRA, where uh, Jerry Sa Jerry Adams and these guys. And what did they do? They went hell for leather against austerity and they didn't form a government. And who's the biggest kind of left party in Ireland now at the moment? Sinn Féin. And listen to like the that Chapo Trap House when they mentioned Sinn Féin. They got like largely they got good reception from the crowd. You know, when the party of Connolly, James Connolly, got fucking absolutely like spat on. It just shows you some long term strategy. God damn it. It's lacking in the left thought. Go. Let's go for the. I'll uh, let's go for these few bits here. I'll highlight that. Puya, you do them. Uh, what we should be willing to do if we had MPs is to put forward for enactment individual elements of our minimum programs and to support individual proposals, say of a labor government, which are consistent with our minimum program. The point of such a policy would be to force supporters of labor in the left, labor left in Britain, left wingers in the coalitionist parties in Europe, and so on to confront the choice between loyalty to the state party and loyalty to the working class. But in order to apply such a policy, we would first have to have a communist party commanding 10 to 20% of the popular vote. As I argued in chapter six, it is illusory to suppose that this policy of United Front can be applied as a substitute for overcoming the division of a Marxist left into competing sets. Without a united Communist Party, the various workers' government and workers' party formulations of Trotskyists are at best empty rhetoric, at worst excuses for diplomatic policy towards the official left. Uh, let, let's just stop there. What do people think about that? Well, at, at least it sort of like answers something that uh, Derek was going towards is this, you know, the problems with the united front. And it kind of also flows from our problems with chewing on that, like, oh, you split away from all of the, <laughs> you split away from like the, the main like workers party, and then you have to like kind of recombine. As far as McNair is concerned, you have to like make like a mass workers party and stay in the mass workers party and have, and fight for the program within that. Um, and, and, you know, and hopefully that workers party can help, you know, set up the next regime uh, as opposed to, you know, like uh, as part of like some kind of coalition, which I don't know, all this sounds like, I'm not sure. I'm not exactly sure what to think about that. I mean, I, I like the, the um, broader point, but though, like some of those specific things that it comes down on, I'm not sure about. So which specifics like, does this really solve the problem of the United like left thing? Like, does it, how do you get like a mass Marxist workers party in the first world? You know, you know what yeah, I'm saying? I, 
<laughs> that gets like I think 20% it's pre- of the vote. <laughs> like Is any that- country like in Europe, any country in Europe where you have uh, proportional representation, it's easy. Okay. It's easy. Fair. Yeah, like, sorry, yeah, like in Ireland, like, there's, the, you know, there's two parties that have about 5% each, so they nearly have 10%, you know. So that's, or, you know, probably have somewhere between 5 and 10%, you know, mm. actual comedy parties. And you say, if you go to France, you go to Italy, you go to Greece, you go to all around the place, it'll be similar all across Europe. Mm-hmm. You know, so it is possible for it to be yeah, uh, I'd like to know. I would like to know, like, uh, the, about the Greek Communist Party, because did they not just kind of follow this thing of never entering government, and they're still no is my, is my understanding that they were kind of hated by, and this is I heard this back when I was an anarchist, so who knows if what their spin on it was, but it was my understanding that the Greek Communist Party during like the uh, 2008 crisis was uh, hated even more than Syriza. And I think it's for similar reasons that we've been talking about, just kind of like capitulation and that sort of thing. Um, but they never entered the government. The Communist Party never entered the government. They were never in the. They were never in government. It might have been uh, the Socialist Pap- Party. Like, you're you're thinking the Socialist Party, the, yeah, the Papandreou. Papandreou. So that's the thing too. Is like they, the anarchists might have just been saying that because the anarchists they know in, in Greek like hated the Communist Party because they're anarchists and yeah, I mean, the Communist Party in Greece is like kind of still Stalin-y, right? Like they are uh, Stalin. It, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. It kind of descends from the the like the Greek Civil War and that sort of tendency. I think there was an international coalition that backed basically the more fasci option over the communists or something. And I don't know. That's like a long history. The the point is is um yeah um tom you're right that it was the socialists that embarrassed themselves um but there was a point where okay the socialists have embarrassed themselves uh there's a kind of new populist left m- populist moment where's the communist party and i think they were too salty i, I you know i don't know the situation on the ground but they're too salty too sal- stalinist too stack se- too sectarian i guess to really make heads or tails of it which brought uh sur- the possibility for a coalition of the radical left syriza into being that, that might have been more or less what what the, what the anarchists were referring to rather than um them like putting in austerity and selling out they just were salty sectarian assholes anyway so you're you 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 two are trying to tell me that there's a communist party right and they were assholes and they were kind of secty get the, <laughs> on now get the hell out <laughs> of here get the hell well, out I, I, I think i think because i think it's worse than like it's worse than like a normal thing like i i understand that like the Communist Party of Greece, kind of like the Russian Communist Party is pretty homophobic. So they haven't really kept pace on like, you know, standards of bourgeois justice and decency. They're, you know, they just don't fit into a modern left project at all. Um, and kind of before we move on real quick, also, I, I kind of wanted to say that I, I feel like this chapter kind of <clears throat> in some ways like short up some of my concerns about the more uh some of the issues we we're talking about earlier with like the united front and splitting um like labor like labor bourgeois labor parties or whatever kind of going back to that idea of like and specifically in like parliamentary countries that have proportional representation i think the clear thing to do in that case is that you you do just remit retain your class independence in your party and try to get you know, ten or twenty percent or whatever to be an oppositional party, and I think there's the, I think that in that particular con- context, the Kotskian strategy works a lot better. I just outside of those specific uh, proportional representation uh, parliaments, like I don't know how you can really implement this still, but I think it solves some some of my concerns at least. Yeah, like I think in uh, like there was like two lines in one of the chapters earlier where he kind of sneaked into Labour Party entryism and he never really went anywhere with it with respect to the book, which is unusual because the book is so situated in UK politics. He basically just he comes up with a, a plan for where it's really only feasible, probably only feasible in a proportional representational place to get that initial jump. But um. Yeah, it is weird. Um, Sophie, do you want to read the final two paragraphs here? Sure. Um, the Koskians were right on a fundamental point. Communists can only take power when we have one majority support from working class rule through extreme democracy. Revolutionary crisis may accelerate the pro- uh, processes of changing political allegiance, but it does not alter this fundamental point or offer a way around it. <clears throat> 
There are no shortcuts, whether by coalitionism or by mass strike. The present task of communists and socialists is therefore not to fight for an alternative government. It is to fight to build an alternative opposition, one which commits itself unambiguously to self-emancipation of the working class through extreme democracy as opposed to all loyalist parties. Okay, I really like them two paragraphs, and I do fully agree with them. Like, you have to build... Mm -hmm. Are basically an opposition and there isn't one at the moment in most countries or if it is it's fucked up and i think that his analysis is broadly correct now whether it comes to like in i think whether depending upon terrain do you do it through a party or do you do it through entryism i think there's definitely a debate to be had about how applicable it is to, say, first past the post or the American situation. But I think the broad idea of building an opposition and using a long-term strategy and not going into government I, does jar with the uh, entryism. But like I, th I think those overall strategies are sound. I, I like this end to the chapter. Uh, Puya, what do you reckon? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mm. think he knows how to build a party that will, can be politically relevant you know that's the well, i know what derek would say here is if if he knows how to build a party that's polit politically relevant why isn't the communist party of great britain um more politically relevant you know why mm. wh why didn't they end up doing honestly what the alliance for workers liberty the awl did and hijack the momentum initiatives within labor right and if you well... and there's there's a Labour Party Marxist organ within, um, it seems like a front group, within a Communist Party of Great Britain. And they their tendency definitely carried the day between the left unity Marxist and the Labour Party Marxist. Even those that have the clear sight to see that this moment was coming or, you know, to understand the dynamics underneath it so that they could, you know, predict it within a reasonable, uh, re reasonably, like they couldn't really take advantage of it. You know, we're still dealing with a s somewhat like marginal sect, even though you have somebody, I mean, you have momentum, you have Corbyn, you know, there, it looks like as the conservatives have just, you know, <laughs> had their second prime minister resign in a row, like um, that it's probably Labour's turn. I don't think it's qu quite the momentum that would help to build a communist party, though, right now. No. I don't yeah, think I, so, yes. I, I, I agree. Not yes. Yeah, I think the momentum isn't there, to be honest. Like, I, I meant and, the know, momentum I think group. Was, like and, and, uh, you meant the oh, momentum really? group. Yeah. Yes, oh, I, yeah, I thought, I, I, oh, I thought you meant, like, the social momentum. Okay, well, I don't think that there's the social momentum right now to... You know, it's just the conditions aren't ripe for... Uh, people to be turning think, to or they might be turning that way but currently you know i think the turn is on yeah like at the, the moment is isn't look there at, for, for look at all the like podcasts it. look at all these yeah. social commie podcasts and they used to all be libertarian and fucking hayek that's all you could find <laughs> it's like five <laughs> years it's changed yeah. it's literally changed in five years i think this is like the major problem with this book is that he doesn't like integrate the political and the and the social, I guess. He doesn't integrate it to, like, see where the, like, what's the driving force of these political movements. Because, um, yeah, yeah, like, you're, like, because, yeah, he has this party with, that, you know, has taken his line, apparently. And, uh, what's well, a really good point that it's not relevant. And, uh, it's just because, you know, uh, the far, our side of the left, you know, we're not in a situation where we're, capable of they, taking political power. I agree, but I think it's because, it's not because the social conditions are ripe. I think, if anything, they're kind of overripe, but I think the issue is that the left can't get its shit together. And I think, I mean, and I, I don't know, this is more from my personal experience than, you know, the uh, CPGB or whatever, but I just don't think, I don't think, uh, I just think all these competing sects get in the way of each other and people wanting to one-up each other on social media and wreck each other's orgs and all that stuff right. is is the primary problem. Um, but I also agree, I do agree that like this book doesn't really address social questions that much. And I don't know if that's necessarily a problem, if that's not what it set out to do, but it is an important component of revolutionary strategy. So maybe it is a problem. I think if we had more, you know, I think if we were in an upturn, I think that 
you know, because usually this, I think, uh, like, just empirically, like, the class struggle, like, becomes more sharp in an upturn, you know, like, in a in a long wave of an upturn, the upturn of a long wave. When you're saying upturn, do you mean upturn of the economy, upturn of, like, labor organization? Yeah, um, yeah and I, I don't know. I, I can't really comment on that. I don't know enough about the political reactions to economics um, in that concrete kind of a way to really comment on that. But one thing that I think I'm starting to get a grasp, starting to get a grasp of is, is what to do with these ideas when you don't live in um, proportional republic or a proportional like parliamentary system. And I think for me, the answer is you still need to build up mass support, but you can't rely on elections as much. I don't. I, I still am very skeptical of you know enacting your minimum program in parliament, and then that triggers a civil war or a revolution when mm-hmm. you you get stopped. Basically, I I just don't see that as a viable as a viable strategy. A country that doesn't have proportional representation, and especially in a country that isn't a parliamentary <laughs> democracy. And so, but I do think you still need to build up mass support. And I still think like you know a strategy of patience and focusing more on a prefigurative kind of uh, components of what like the SP day did um, is key um, to building that mass support. You know, the, the thing where Pui, I think you're right that the book suffers from obscuring maybe the social stuff going on underneath, even though I know McNair is thinking about it is that we're in a moment right now where more educated kind of types and, you know, petty bourgeois like D-class A, you might say, are becoming more politically radicalized. But the dominant trends in politics, specifically within the proletariat, but also just nationally, generally, is towards um, disassociation and, you know, alienation. That's what makes this moment kind of so confusing. On the one hand, there is a sort of polarization, you know, within a politically active substratum. And then on the other hand, the broad masses of people whose fates are at stake are more or less disengaged. That's something that this book doesn't really give us, you know, strategy on. This book is, you know, isolating political strategy. And as far as that goes, it's, I mean, it's a really clear work of political science. It's a provocative work of, of strategy. Yeah. Without, without thinking about the broader social question, it is like kind of harder to, grapple with what to do even strategically, even for the factors that this book is tackling, because, you know, where are the masses of workers if we want to stand with them? They're in the car park outside Walmart. We're getting yeah. ready now. I mean, yeah, if, if, but I think if the masses of workers were there and uh, like, but the thing is that the masses of workers aren't there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, and you know, so, I think that'll right. change in the future, though. In case it doesn't, I'm sure some of these strategic points will still have an impact on what to do from there. And I'd just like to see more developed in that capacity. I think, I forget who's saying this, but, you know, thinking about this book as suggesting a direction based on what kind of government you're in is pretty solid, I think. Um, it's important to remember that McNair is writing this in a parliament system that isn't proportional representation. Um, So when we're talking about proportional representation, we are kind of saying McNair's argument doesn't apply to his context. (laughs) But it's, you know, we're going, I mean, we're going to sort of see how labor plays out in British politics, I think. Really, you know, for first past the post, For people in countries with first-past-the-post electoral systems, we have a lot to sort of think about and engage with. I think the social question is probably bigger than what kind of government you have. But insofar as we can think about strategy before the social can line up with our political, you know, desires, that it's, you know, something we have to consider.
On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and The Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, and Swampside Chats. <laughs>